Hello, and welcome to our presentation today, Why DNA Sequence Matters, the Impact of Epistemology, Psychology, and Taxonomic Error on Biodiversity Measurement. Brief agenda for today. First, we'll have some speaker introductions, followed by our scientific presentation, a brief overview of Omega Biotech, and ending with a questions and answers session. First, to introduce our presenters. My name is Charles Cotton, Marketing Manager here at Omega Biotech. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Jeffrey Nicola. Dr. Jeffrey Nicola received his PhD from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill in 1994. He has enjoyed a long academic career spanning serving as a Smithsonian Institute intern in 1986 to being an associate professor at the University of Wisconsin Green Bay from 1994 to 2004 adjunct associate professor at the University of New Mexico from 2005 to 2018 to his current associate professorship in the Department of Botany and Zoology in the Faculty of Science at Masaryk University in the Czech Republic. He is also a research associate at the Carnegie Museum of Natural History and Department of Maleocology Academy of Natural Sciences of Drexel University. He has dedicated his career to exploring the ultimate mechanisms responsible for diversification of life on Earth and has used land snails as a model group for much of that the last two decades. His work is currently funded by two awards from the Czech Science Foundation and by grants from the U.S. Department of the Interior. He serves on the editorial board of Molecologia, Zootaxa, and the Journal of Molluscan Studies and is a member of the Mollusk Specialist Group in the International Union for the conservation of nature. As of February 15, 2022, his 89 published peer-reviewed works have generated 8,659 citations worldwide. Dr. Kieran Derviswala is a product manager at Omega Biotech, leading efforts to develop and deliver novel nucleic acid isolation products for various research and diagnostic fields. She obtained her PhD in chemical engineering from the University of Florida in Gainesville, she went on to receive postdoctoral training at Georgia Institute of Technology. Dr. Derviswala has served as a biological scientist at Open Cell Technologies, developing an innovative intracellular delivery and transfection device before joining the team at Omega Biotech. She has authored several peer reviewed journal papers and is passionate about translating fundamental research platforms into practical technologies. Now, it is my pleasure to welcome. Dr. Jeffrey Nicola. Thanks, Charles. It's uh, really a, a privilege to be able to speak with everyone today. I'm going to talk today about sort of the history of science and, and how that actually helps us understand a little bit about the state of taxonomy in the modern world and the things we need to do to make taxonomy better and why that's important for those of us who are ecologists or biodiversity um, experts in trying to save the world's biodiversity, that there's some things maybe we need to do better. Um, I wanna start the talk um, actually um, dealing with philosophy. And I do like to point out to my students that we actually, those of us who finish get a PhD, which is a doctor of philosophy. So we shouldn't be, um, um, worried about talking about philosophy every now and again. And I want to talk about the philosophical field that's called epistemology. And it's from the ancient Greek word episton. And it's the branch of philosophy that um, asks the question, when do beliefs become so well um, um, known that they can become knowledge? So how do we know things? When are beliefs justified? When can a belief be considered truth? And epistemology also starts to deal with issues like expert testimony, um, memory, perception, and issues like that, because that can influence what we think we know. Go back a little bit further, where did science start from? What was going on before uh, modern science was available? And we go back to the to the Middle Ages, and there was um, academic pursuits were, were undertaken in something that was called scholasticism. And scholasticists um, were mainly interested in trying to reconcile Aristotle's views with Christian dogma. 
And what they believed was that you understood truth by taking a look at written the written word and then making witty arguments with language and to dispute everything in minute detail with those various uh, written texts until they came to consensus um, based on the previously written text and that those that consensus then became um, knowledge. The problem is, is that, well, not everything that Aristotle wrote down was correct. And so the fathers of modern science, people like Leonardo da Vinci and Sir Francis Bacon, rejected this idea that we could only base truth and understanding on previously written texts. And they said, no, we should use our own eyes. We should use our own experience um, and observations uh, to guide um, our, our, our understanding of the world. So, you know, so like Leonardo says, if you find from your own experience that something is a fact and it contradicts what some other authority has written down, you must abandon the authority and base your reasoning on your own findings. So this is a big difference. This was a huge watershed change. And, and so with this in mind, John Evelyn, um, one of the first members of the Royal Society of London, the world's first modern scientific society, uh, chose the Latin phrase nullius in verba to be the motto for the Royal Society. And it means in Latin, on the word of no one or take nobody's word for it. And what it represents is the determination of the fellows of the academy to withstand the domination of authority and to verify all statements by an appeal to facts. So we're getting away from, from, from authority-based um, a belief system to a, an evidence-based belief system. But there's a problem here. Cognitive biases can influence our, ob our ability to observe the world in a fair way. So some of the things that can influence some of the cognitive biases that can be important are things like your personal history. You know, the way we were, our, our, our personal histories, the things we were exposed to growing up can influence the way we interpret stimuli that come into our brains. There's something called gestalt reconfiguration, which means, uh, which happens when independent um, features, multiple independent features are, are tied together to make some sort of single integrated whole. And that's basically what we do with, um, when we look at the night sky and, and we see the various constellations. Those are not, you know, Libra does not exist. Um, it's something that only exists in our mind as we reconfigure the positions of stars. Sociocognitive factors mean that, that the influence of society can also determine how we perceive the world. Um, cognitive dis dissonance happens when faulty ideas are defended um, using increasingly incoherent rationales when, when you are vested in those ideas. There's some other things that are really important um, besides those first four. There's anchoring bias, which is your very first observation um, becomes the most important and sometimes is, is, is over, over um, uh, I guess, over relied upon. There's confirmation bias when you tend to favor the information which supports your pre-existing beliefs. Uh, one of my favorites is the Dunning-Kruger effect, which people with poor knowledge or skills tend to think they're much smarter and more competent than they really are. There's also egocentric bias when you, when you tend to rely too heavily on your own perspective and not others. There's also extension neglect, which happens when you um, draw general conclusions from an unrepresentative small sample size. So how can these various cognitive biases affect scientific observation, which is what Bacon and da Vinci wanted us to do in favor of reading old texts? Well, let's take a look first from something outside of biology. Um, let's take a look at, at the field of astronomy. And Percival Lowell is a very famous astronomer, went to Flagstaff, Arizona, set up his observatory there, and he became fascinated in Mars. And when he looked at Mars through his telescope, his mind saw canals and oases. And he interpreted this as meaning that there was an alien race living on a now desert world that was desperately trying to survive by, by moving water from the poles down to the equator. The problem was, is that other astronomers, when they looked at Mars through their telescopes, couldn't see those canals. 
and you know not everyone believed what he was saying and so there was no way to assess whether Lal was right or others were right until we had an independent way to photograph and assess what Mars actually looked like and in fact it wasn't until the 1960s when we put um, space probes in orbit around Mars that we could establish beyond all doubt that there were no canals of any size. So the main thing is is that Percival Lal saw and reported things that did not exist. And how could he do that as a scientist? Well, part of it was his individual history. His family's wealth was due to moving goods and materials um, throughout New England on a canal system. And he grew up in an era when the Suez and Panama canals were being built and were part of the um, um, sort, of, um, uh, sort of experience of people of that time. Gestalt reconfiguration happened when he saw individual little dark spots on the surface in his mind and you know, connected them together in, in features that didn't exist. So again, kind of making a constellation um, out of the points that he saw on Mars. The sociocognitive factors came into play because these theories about Martian aliens and canals brought him considerable fame. And, and you know, a lot of the books about Martian aliens really come from Percival Lowell in his writings on Martian canals back in the early 1900s. Cognitive dissonance comes into, into play when he fused, refused to admit that he might be an error. In fact, his number one trusted assistant, A.E. Douglas, was fired by him after Douglas questioned him about whether or not the canals really existed. So Lowell really you know, held tight to this belief. So it's not just astronomy though. And now we're gonna start moving into biology, which is my field. And when I was um, an undergraduate, I worked for a few summers with Terry Frest and we were looking at algific talus slopes. Terry Frest got his PhD in paleontology from the University of Iowa. And he applied that paleontological training to become the regional expert on land snails in the upper Midwestern USA. Where he's probably most well known in the central part of North America is for the coining of the term algific talus slope. And these are, are ice caves, buried ice caves on north facing hillsides that um, release refrigerated air onto the surface um, and makes um, uh, an ice age like patches of habitat on these small little patches in northeastern Iowa. And there's all kinds of ice age plants and animals that persist on those patches to this day. The thing is, is before Fress's work and before Fress geologically figured out how to predict where these things would exist, very few were known, none were protected. And all of these, these algebic telescopes are very fragile and easily destroyed by livestock and even scientific research. The problem was there was no way to protect these habitats because there were only two species found on them that were afforded legal protection. So there was almost no money available to protect these fascinating sites. Now that all changed in the late 80s, early 90s, when Terry reported to various government agencies the presence of eight additional undescribed endemic land snail taxa from these sites. And if we consider those sites, um, if we take those species into account, all of a sudden we can justify the protection of 70 additional sites and those were prioritized for protection. And that's all great. Um, we helped save a really valuable habitat. However, when you go back and look at all the shells that were collected, you go back into the field and you recollect those sites, and you look at thousands of these shells, none of those shells look like his illustrations. And you can see that on the panels above, his drawings on the left and the actual shells on the right. And the other thing is, is that there was continual gradation between all of those various forms that he described. Subsequently, I went in and got DNA out of these and was able to show that all, none of those endemic species were valid. And they simply represented a weakly defined shell forms of a pre-existing species called Vertigo arthuri. And it ranges from Newfoundland to Alaska and down the Rocky Mountains all the way to northern New Mexico. So again, we can ask the question, how can Terry Frest, a scientist, a serious scientist, see species that simply did not exist? And again, we can go back to those four points that affected Percival Lowell. Number one is individual history. 
he was trained in paleontology. And a paleontologist doesn't have the ability to really look at the biology of a species. It can only, you can only look at the fossils. You can only see the morphology of bones and shells. And so he wasn't used to thinking about things in a biological way. It was totally visual. And so for him, um, he could look at shells and his, and then Gestalt reconfiguration came into play and his mind connected various features and he saw these ideal versions of, of eight different species. Um, and, and it was all sort of done in his head. Sociocognitive factors came into play because through these efforts, he was able to prioritize for protection 70 sites that otherwise would not have been. And I also have to admit, because I, you know, I was hired by him to work on this project, he also got 10 years of grant funding out of seeing these species. So he was getting things back from seeing the world in this way. And this then leads to cognitive dissonance in that because of he was vested in this worldview, um, he ignored the fact that no single individual looked like any of his drawings and that his illustrated ideal forms graded from one to the other in the real shells. Um, and so there was nothing, there was no really distinct species there. So from looking at either Percival Lowell or Terry Fress, we can see that it's possible for supposedly objective scientific observations to be made faulty because of cognitive bias. So what did the fathers of science, the grandfathers of science back at the dawn of the Renaissance do about this? Well, one solution that they came up with was to limit knowledge only to observations that had been empirically vetted across multiple individuals or data streams. In other words, replication. You have to replicate your findings. And if you can replicate the findings across multiple individuals or data streams, you, would, you exclude some of the most egregious cases of this kind of cognitive bias. And so because of that, the confrontation of statements with empirical data gathered from multiple signals has become a foundational concept underlying the epistemology of modern science. Well, most modern science, that is, because taxonomy falls out of that category. And the reason is, is the international codes of zoological and botanical nomenclature do not require that statements that are made when you erect a new name be validated with empirical data before being treated as knowledge. And in fact, um, tax, taxonomic justification often is grounded solely on the opinion of experts. And in such cases, when we're just dealing with expert opinion, defense of taxonomic concepts unfortunately takes on the flavor of medieval scholasticism. And anyone who's been involved with taxonomy for very long um, has seen these endless debates that can't be resolved because um, the taxonomists are just basing their arguments on their own personal opinions. And also when we're dealing with expert opinion, this means that it's also relatively easy for these cognitive biases to come into play and to play a large role in the decisions that are being made. So, for instance, um, in mollusks, which is the group I work on, land snails, it's the second largest animal phyla. Um, Meta-analysis over a 20-year period um, in the last 20 years shows that less than 5% of recently described new species even attempt to measure the morphological variability within that species, let alone to empirically confront the null hypothesis that the new form falls within some previously named entity. So for those ecologists and conservation people who need to use these names or these concepts, we have no recourse but to accept on faith that the author's words in those descriptions are true and are not influenced by cognitive bias. And this is a real problem because we've already seen in the case of Terry Fress that you know, those biases can be, can be large. So how can we move taxonomy and the fields which use the concepts that are generated by taxonomists to follow the admonition of nullius and verba from the dawn of modern science? So how do we make taxonomy a modern science? Well, there is, you know, some taxonomists make the argument that it's impossible that um, species and taxonomic categories are inherently untestable and only exist within the mind. 
I don't agree with that at all. Um, and I don't because we know that biological species represent largely independent evolutionary units. And once you become largely independent um, in evolutionary time, those different entities will be exposed to different selection pressures, different random walks, different histories. And so because of that, a legitimate taxa should demonstrate uniqueness. And not only uniqueness in one empirical signal, but multiple signals. In other words, we can replicate these results. Turns out that's that astronomers already are, are using this basic approach, that a consensus-based multi-signal analysis is, is extensively used in by astronomers, where it's called multi-messenger astronomy. And in this, we look at the same um, features in the universe using visible light, gamma rays, cosmic rays, neutrinos, gravitational waves now. And from those, we get a more um, complete picture of what we're looking at. We can also start to look at consensus across different signals. Turns out that taxonomy has, some taxonomists have been moving in this direction already. And they call this integrative taxonomy, and it's really the exact biological analog of multi-messenger astronomy. And in this idea, excuse me, species level hypotheses are accepted as valid only after a significant distinction is shown across a consensus of multiple signals. And those things can be things like um, the sculpture on for land snails, the sculpture of the shell, the coloration of the body, the, the shell shape, the morphometrics, the um, shape of the anatomy inside of the shell, particularly genitalia, um, also the ecology and the biogeography. And for our purposes of this talk, also various um, uh, DNA sequence um, data sets um, like mitochondria and different um, linkage groups in the nuclear genome. And I really like this quote from Sherlock Holmes at the bottom, which really I think encapsulates this. It's from the disappearance of Lady Frances Carfax. And Sherlock Holmes says to Watson, when you follow separate chains of thought, Watson, you will find some point of intersection which should approximate the truth. So even Sherlock Holmes was doing multi-messenger, um, in this case, investigations. So let's look at the DNA sequence in particular. This is a really excellent signal um, or signals to empirically test for taxonomic concepts because individual base pair substitutions are mostly evolutionary neutral and they also those those substitutions occur at various rates across the genome um, allowing for resolution from very shallow to very deep phylogenetic scales there's a problem though and this is something that i had to deal with and that is that molluscan dna amplification is often really difficult um, because of inhibitors that are present in the mucus and in chemicals in the hepatopancreas and when I first started doing um, uh, gathering DNA signal uh, to do integrative taxonomy, I got into real problems because after a few days of, of uh, extraction of the DNA, PCR stopped from these inhibitors. And so I had to do all of these signals. I had to get all of these signals assembled within about a 36 hour period, or I had to, or I had to extract another individual. And I, because of that, I almost abandoned the use of DNA signals until I discovered the Omega Biotech eZNA uh, models kit. And what's beautiful about it is that it's been optimized to remove those inhibitory compounds. And it does such a good job at it that I now have unlimited time to generate and investigate these multiple signals. So I'm not, there isn't a 36 hour, you know, timer um, that goes off as soon as the extraction starts. I, I have time to think about it and do it carefully and correctly. So back to um, the back to the DNA signals. There are four different regions that people often look at. They differ in their links. They differ in the number of, of base pairs that vary um, between species. Um, the most common one that's used is cytochrome oxidase one. You see in the bottom left there. So it's about 60, 655 um, um, base pairs in length, the part that we amplify. And on average, there's about 67, 65 to 70 base pair differences between species. 
And the only problem is, is it's, it's kind of long. And so I often use Cytochrome B, which has the same number of variable sites, but in about half the length of DNA. And so it, it amplifies more readily in degraded DNA, which you often get from museum specimens. Okay, how about on the nuclear side? Um, uh, at the moment, we're kind of limited to um, um, what's called the rRNA gene cassette. And there's um, the black areas that are shown here, the large subunit 18S, the 5.8S, and 28S are, are ultra-conserved elements. They, um, they evolve extremely slowly, and they allow us to, to determine phylogeny and evolutionary history at very deep phylogenetic scales. Inserted between them are two internal transcribed spacers that evolve much more rapidly. And they actually um, evolve more quickly enough to allow for um, distinction between species. In fact, when you concatenate, when you add together ITS1 and 2, you get about 32 or so um, uh, different bases between species uh, within a genus. <clears throat> so um, how do you, if you have all these different options available, for um, for amplification analysis, how do you choose the one that you want to use to, to test your questions? And it's really um, it's 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 really dependent upon the material that you have available to you and the questions you want to test. Um, the main thing is is that the statistics of 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 DNA analysis and tree generation means that you really want to have um, about ten to fifty variable bases between neighboring branches. And if you have fewer um, variable bases than this, um, you'll get um, low resolution and node support because you just don't have enough information. Um, if you have more than that, it's actually too variable and it's what, what's called base pair saturation will occur and will also lead to poor resolution and support for the deeper nodes. And so because of that, you want to, there's a sweet spot that's about 10 to 50 between neighboring um, um, groups. And so, you know, it turns out if you want to do really deep phylogenies, you want to look at how genera, families, superfamilies, um, orders um, relate to each other, you use 28S. Um, if you're interested from the subgenus to species level, ITS1 and 2 added together, or 16S from the mitochondrial side, give you really good data. And if you're really just interested in the species level, then you're looking at the more rapidly evolving things like CO1, CO2, or cytochrome B. And also, as I've also previously mentioned, remember that the length of the region that you are amplifying um, is, in, uh, is, is inversely correlated with the success of amplification. So the longer the area you amplify, the somewhat harder it is to 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 have successful PCR. So the shorter the region, the more apt you are to get successful amplification, even if the DNA is degraded. And that's again why I use cytochrome B rather than CO1. There is a roadmap for conducting this multi-messenger taxonomy. Um, the first thing you've got to do is put together a good specimen set. Um, this is only as good as the replicates that you're going to be um, analyzing. So one specimen doesn't work. Uh, you want to select individuals across the full range of morphology and geography and ecologic and ecology for each recognized species. Um, so, so capture the entire entity as it's now understood. And you want to also make sure you include material that originates from near the type locality because given the rules of nomenclature, that's going to tell you which DNA sequence is related to a particularly um, particular you know, name that exists. And then you do the DNA sequence analysis um, to figure out what's going on. You extract the DNA using the Omega Biotech kit that I mentioned before. And then you use um, old fashioned PCR and Sanger se sequencing to obtain mitochondrial nuclear sequence. You notice I'm not talking about Illumina here or any kind of genomic process. And the reason is, is that we need these separate signals. And if you do analysis in um, an Illumina genomic data set, everything gets lumped together into one, one signal. 
Um, and we really don't want that. We, so we need to go back and use some more old fashioned technology, which works really well. Once we get those separate signals, we conduct separately phylogenetic reconstructions on those different signals. And then we identify likely species level units by noting when we have highly supported clades containing the same individuals in both of the signals or across the various signals. And then we need to step back and turn the DNA into something um, you know, that we can see with our own eyes and we have to find other signals. So we sort the material in collections into these genetically identified groups. We then look separately at the material that we haven't ground up to get DNA from to see what physical, ecological, behavioral, biogeographic signals correlate with those genetically defined groups. And, and when we're doing morphology, then what we want to do is we want to do morphometrics and show that there are significant differences using statistical p-values between certain traits in these different genetically identified groups. And so we then consider a species to be empirically validated when the two DNA signals are shown to correspond to other distinct macroscopic signals. We then compile the results and, and, um, and come up with a list of diagnostic traits that we use to allow for accurate identification of each supported taxon. And ultimately, at the end of the day, we use that type location DNA to determine what's the available name for each supported clade. And if you have a clade that doesn't have a name associated with it, well, then you get to describe something new. So what percent of accepted but empirically unvetted tax are in error? So if we take the conventional wisdom and taxonomy for a group and we go through this process of multi-messenger um, analysis um, and figure out how things were wrong and correct those mistakes, what are the error rates? And what is the impact on ecology and biodiversity analyses? So there are three ways that taxon the traditional taxonomic ideas can be wrong. You could have the wrong diagnostic characters. You're using the wrong features to identify the, the organism. They could be oversplit, which means that you have, like what Terry Fress did, you could have one species that you split into multiple entities that aren't real. Or you can have things that are overlumped. You can have things that were all put together into one species when in fact they're biologically separate. And we're gonna take a look at three different holarctic genera that we've done um, sort of full analyses uh, across the um, holarctic realm. Uh, we're going to look at Eucanulus fulvus group, uh, the pupillas, um, which is a, a slightly larger land snail, um, and also vertigo. And all these results are presented in a paper that I just put out in ecography um, in the spring. And so you can uh, look it up there. So what were the taxonomic error rates? And this is where it gets really kind of um, sort of shocking. It turns out less than 50% of the species that of the originally understood species in these three groups were correct in all ways. That a, a little over one quarter had incorrect identification features that had been identified and listed. Another slightly over a quarter had been oversplit and really weren't good species at all. And of the species that had incorrect diagnoses, uh, half of them were actually represented species that had been overlumped, um, things that were actually biologically distinct, but were not considered distinct. And it turns out that these rates are pretty much consistent across Europe and Central Asia and North America. And so it's, 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 it speaks to sort of the psychology of taxonomists being the same across the world. How does those that 50% error rate affect our estimations of species richness. And it turns out, if we just look at North America as one group and Eurasia at the other, um, it turns out Eurasia, there wasn't a lot of difference at the site scale. So if we're looking at individual sites, uh, the taxonomy wasn't, didn't change that much. But North America turned out t over 10% of the sites um, had incorrect estimates of species richness. And in those cases, um, more than 90% of those cases was reporting too many species. And then as we go to larger and larger scales of observation to biogeographic regions, or then entire zones, which are like, you know, a third of a continent or something like that, 
um, these rates of, of error become more significant and become more common. And in fact, over-reporting of species um, becomes more common. So that at the point when you're dealing with a third of a continent um, zone, um, in all nine biogeographic zones, too many species are being reported. So we were overestimating biodiversity. How about the composition of sites or regions or biogeographic zones? And it turns out about 50% of North American and 25% of Eurasian sites had incorrect species lists because of the bad taxonomy. When we go to regions, areas like the size of a few states, um, it goes up to over 90%. And when you get up to the biogeographic zone scale, it's 100%. All of them had incorrect species lists that had been generated. And so another thing we can look at it with those species lists is how um, those species lists change over space. Um, and it turns out that um, this was not a random error either. That um, it turns out that at short distances, a traditional taxonomy reported too much um, difference between um, um, areas that were near to each other and too little difference in areas that were uh, more distant and uh, more, more far apart. And the reason for that is, is that oversplitting was more apt to occur um, at short spatial scales and overlumping at bigger spatial scales. And the reason for that is psychologically, um, a taxonomist is going to come to think that they know everything in their backyard very well and will see all these minor differences and assume that that means something biologically and will tend to oversplit. Whereas at large spatial scales where they don't know what's going on in the intervening distances, they're more apt to say, well, those are all probably one thing and we're just looking at, at simple clinal variation. So it turns out that um, the uniqueness of faunas, that when you, when you make similarity um, higher than it should be at short scales and um, lower than it should be at broad scales, what you do is you underreport how much uniqueness there is between faunas across the world. So this is kind of a big deal. So it turns out that all this epistemology and all this crazy stuff that we're talking about ends up having real importance in the real world. And it turns out that when you don't um, use modern science, when you don't empirically challenge taxonomic ideas and you allow taxonomic ideas to be based on expert opinion, um, what you end up doing is you end up overestimating the richness phase. You report too many species in general. Um, you also can have anywhere from you know 25 to 100 percent of the species lists that you make are going to be an error, and you're going to underestimate the actual rate that that faunas change over the course of over the space of the Earth, and that these problems become greater and greater the bigger the observational scale. So what this all means is that epistemology is really important and we can't forget that we need to um, use extreme caution when we use an unvalidated taxonomic concept um, and that we need to go back and we need to, you know, challenge the taxonomic community to go back and actually, you know, use modern scientific approaches to test their hypotheses. And if we do that, we'll get cleaner data and we'll be better able to protect um, the biodiversity of the natural world. And I want to thank Michael Horshack and Jan Divisek, um, my colleagues at Masaryk University, and the Czech Science Foundation who helped support this work. And I'm happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you, Dr. Nikola, for that informative and educational webinar. It is always enriching and rewarding for us to know how our customers use our kits in unique applications. Without taking too much of your time, I would like to introduce you all to Omega Biotech. Omega Biotech was founded in 1998 and we are based out of Atlanta, Georgia. Our expertise is in providing innovative DNA and RNA purification solutions. We cater to a wide variety of customers who are working in varied fields like clinical and basic research, biotechnology, diagnostics, as well as agricultural industries. Um, we are currently 125 plus strong globally, and we are growing constantly. 
our passion and our passion is to provide quality products and services to the customers we serve. So our presence is felt around the globe through more than 52 distributor partners worldwide. As I mentioned before, our corporate office is located in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, this is where bulk of our R&D and manufacturing takes place. We also have an office in London where we provide both sales and tech support help to our customers. Uh, we are both ISO 9001 2015 and ISO 13485 certified. On the slide, I want to briefly talk about the Omega Advantage. What I mean by that is we provide excellent pre and post sales support. Um, that is basically we are right there with you helping you choose the right kit to placing that solution on your end. Uh, we have an excellent field application support team who are knowledgeable in um, scripting and providing that automation help on most open-ended platforms such as Hamilton, TCAN, and Kingfisher. So what it basically does is it helps our customers go up and running in no time. Something that Omega does, which, uh, which I'm very, very proud to explain to you all is, uh, we provide that customer sample testing and validation help. So we actually uh, allow customers to ship the samples and validate it on our automation platforms. So this basically helps the customers gain that firsthand knowledge and information without actually investing any resources on their end. Uh, the other big advantage with Omega Biotech is we provide custom kits so we can actually tailor the kits, tailor the products to match the customer needs. Uh, from individual components to kits that include dead volumes, we can do it all for you. Apart from providing quality products, um, we also are very, very cost effective. Uh, for example, an average Omega Biotech customer saves over 30% on consumable costs compared to our competitors. So we provide a wide array of products in different product lines, ranging from plasma DNA purification, genomic DNA purification, to NGOs cleanup solutions. We boast a portfolio of more than 400 products encompassing different extraction technologies like columns, plates, as well as magnetic beads. These technologies are available in different kits and configurations depending on sample types, applications that our customers require. With that, I thank you all for your attention. Do connect with us, check us out at omegabiotech.com. Um, we do provide free samples. So those links and that information is available on our website. Um, I thank you all for your attention and it's time for some questions and I'll hand it over to our moderator. Thank you. All right, thank you. We have some time for some questions today. First, uh, Dr. Nicola, um, how did you collect your samples across so many regions? Uh, um, well, um, it's just, I guess, whenever I am out doing things, um, I, I always have my collecting tools with me and I just try to be creative in you know, the small amounts of money that I get for research you know, I'm always collecting no matter where I go. And, and then, you know, finding collaborators like, uh, you know, Michael Horshack, who's been working in Europe all the way to Central Asia. I have, you know, people I work with in Japan, just always having my sample gear with me. And when I can, you know, sneak it in, doing something else, I do it. Okay, thank you. Um, so do you, how do you preserve your samples? Um, ah, now yeah, that's so you... where I get, things are lucky. It turns out that these land snails, particularly the small ones that I work with, and these are, most of them are about the size of Lincoln's head on a penny. Um, they dry so quickly that the DNA is, uh, does not degrade um, if they go, if they turn into mummies. So if, if, this, if the snail individual, um, you know, di dies while it's estivating, while it's sleeping, um, it loses its water so quickly that it turns into snail jerky and you get absolutely perfect DNA. And in fact, we've been now able to get um, DNA, amplify and sequence DNA from museum specimens that are over 170 years old. 
Oh, all right. Thank you. Um, we have yeah. a question online. Um, in your experience, Dr. Nicola, how receptive are taxonomists that have only used morphology to this integrated approach? Um, they're pretty upset and they don't like to hear this. Um, it's This is... Um, become kind of a, a, a holy quest of mine to try to help them, you know, guide them into the modern world. Um, it's not, it doesn't go well, um, particularly if you have people who have gone into taxonomy because traditionally you don't need to know mathematics or yes. chemistry. Yeah, so it's it's been difficult, but I, I keep trying. All right, thank you. All right, another another question we received um, for Kieran. Um, yep, is this mollusk kit suitable for cleaning DNA samples obtained from poke, a fermented agave sap drink that contains large amounts of dextrins and oligosaccharides? That, that's a pretty interesting application, I would say. Um, so this kit is very robust from uh, the presentation that you've seen. Um, it uses a very robust lysis. Um, so if any kit can do it, this can. Uh, but having said that, we would need to get more information like, you know, um, if there's any sample preservation that's involved, um, what kind of DNA is the NCAS customer targeting? Like, are they looking for pathogenic DNA, host DNA? Um, what's the downstream. So based on that, uh, our product support team can definitely help identify the right kit. Uh, so definitely get in touch with our product support team or email us at info at omegabiotech.com and we can help you with kit recommendation. All right, thank you. Um, another question for Dr. Nicola. Um, do you have to enrich your mitochondria DNA? Um, relative to the nuclear DNA for your analysis? No, not at all, no. Um, have had no trouble. I use the same concentrations of, of um, template for, for both reactions. And I'm now working with new nuclear regions that are single copy um, and it works just fine for them too. All right, thank you very much. Um, another question. For Kieran, mm -hmm. given the uh, the global reagent shortages, how robust is it to get kits delivered from Omega Biotech? Yeah, very relevant question. Um, I want to tell the audience that you know we have ramped up our production capacity significantly, and in the recent past, we've also acquired another facility in response to the increased demand, so that we're able to maintain sufficient stockpiles of our kits. Um, we also maintain our inventory at different warehouses so that we're able to like, you know, quickly supply um, according to the demands and customer orders. Um, I just want to give you all an example that even during the last years of pandemic, where the glo global reagent shortage was at the all-time high, we were able to deliver all our kits on time, and most of our kits were not back ordered. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, another question, I guess, tied into similar to the, uh, the question about the agave sap, what other type of samples can be processed using the mollusk kit? Okay. So in addition to the land snails that Dr. Nicola just presented, this kit can be used with like sea snails, uh, arthropods, insects like, you know, round worms, flat worms, basically any invertebrates which are rich in mucosa. Mucopolysaccharide, this is a very good kit to use. All right, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, we had one last question online and I think you addressed it in the presentation, but how can I get free samples? For sure. Um, so you can, um, if you go on our website, on the product pages, there should be a link for uh, requesting free samples. So uh, the customer can go and fill in their information. We will contact you. And based on the location, we may connect you to the relevant distributor so that we can arrange for samples through them. But if it's uh, if the sample request comes 
um, you know, from United States of America, we ship those directly. All right. Mm -hmm. um, thank you very much. If there are no other questions, um, those are all the questions we had submitted and it doesn't look like there are any more online. I wanna thank everyone from joining us here today. And um, if you'd like to go back and revisit the webinar, a recording will be available online. So thank you very much, Dr. Nicola and Kieran for your presentation. I was happy to be here with everyone. Thank you. Thank you.